awesome. I've got my no brand loyalty t-shirt. <laughs> Are you in Massachusetts right now? I'm sorry, say that again? Are you in Massachusetts right now? I am. I'm, I'm in the living room at uh, the house at IMA. Wow. Yeah. wow. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to hear about wow. that. Ew. Yeah, it's pretty, it's a fable. I mean, it's like, it's incredible that that had happened and how it all happened. How long have you been living in Massachusetts for, June? We moved here, we closed on this property right before 9-11, wow. uh, so 19 years ago. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were trying to keep IMA going both here and, and Bodega, California, which where we had been renting a space, but we, I mean, we just couldn't do We needed two staffs and so much more money, and you yeah. know, we had to give up California and, and concentrate on what we we're doing here, and that turned out to be the right decision. I'll bet right now you don't miss California so much. Yeah, it's tough. yeah, really tough. Yeah. June, when did you move to California? Is that when you started uh, being in bands and started Fanny and or or, or the uh, when did you move to California? Well, let me give you the brief overview. We moved to Sacramento when I was thirteen from Manila. And so when we started our first band, we were in Sacramento. And, um, but by 1969, we had our record deal. So there we were in LA. And, what band uh, was that? So that was Fanny. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, since then, I've, you know, we spent quite a few years uh, doing Fanny and being in LA, but then women's music, that, which also was LA. Uh, uh, but then they moved up to San Francisco. So, you know, I would say LA and San Fran the San Francisco Bay Area, including Sacramento, have been my main haunts all my life until we bought this property in 2001. Wow. Yeah, it seems like Sacramento, you know, coming from the Philippines, it must have been like a pretty <laughs> massive change. I mean, LA is one thing, but did it seem like that? I mean, was it well, the fact move? that it was, yeah, the fact that it was America was a huge change, even, even though my dad, um, I'm the eldest of seven, actually, but um, our dad um, was from Vermont and, uh, you know, was a white American from Vermont, but we never really experienced that. So um, it was a massive change. Culturally, our clothes were behind. Nobody knew where the Philippines was, you know. So it, that was really tough, and, and music was what brought us into, let's say, society or community or people even talking to us. Yeah, and I was, was reading some really of your interviews, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And you were talking about that, how that sort of was what got you to be, you know, welcomed here. Yeah, I mean, it was like prying open the, the lid of a can, you know, just little bit by little bit. Uh, I was so, well, we were both really shy and insecure, but the music filled us with the confidence and the, uh, the light, really, of, of pure joy and, and love and everything that you can think of as good. It's so that so, gave us the courage. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. Were you familiar with popular American music before you came over? Well, only through the radio. So Harry Belafonte songs, um, uh, tell Laura, I love her. We loved uh, Anita Bryant, even uh, Paul Anka, uh, Carol King. We'd never heard of, you know. Um, Will you still love me tomorrow? I remember it just riveted me when I first heard it on the radio when it came, and it was an oldie here. I mean, it was it had been hit for a hit for what a year or something like that. But um, we were. We only played music on ukulele that we'd heard on the radio. So we could play along with Hang Down Your Head, Tom Dooley, or, right? Uh, yeah, Ricky Nelson, Wandering Man. I love that kind of stuff. I still love, but I consider my pop, myself a pop meister, not really a rock and roller. That, that developed while we were in, in Fanny and what um, the industry demanded of us. And... Uh, our uh, keyboard player was really into rock in that pure sense. You know, she kind of poo-pooed all the other stuff that Gina and I loved. <laughs> so we had to go with with that harder edge. And, uh, you know, I've never actually quite gotten over that because I love doing all types of music. I hate being typecast just into rock, you know, because I feel yeah. that it all feeds into the humanity and the, the actual fabric of music. 
Well, it must be so interesting working with all these different young women coming to the center there because they come in with every kind of music and every kind of background, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. You know, I, I say now that IMA is a teacher because I learn so much through everything that goes on at IMA and the girls, you know. I mean, um, they're the ones that turned me on to Adele. I didn't even know Adele was happening. <laughs> She's great. Yeah, yeah. But, but you know, you know yeah. mm -hmm, I was ahead. just going to say, I was just going to say, you know, you 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 talk more about pop and all that kind of stuff, but you do play mm -hmm. a mean electric lead guitar. I mean, you know, yeah. I saw you. I saw you <laughs> oh, in you a did? concert Where? in 1973 at the Whiskey. Ah, it was one of the we... first times I think I even went to the Whiskey. Yeah. And I'm not even 100% sure, I had your, your first album, but I don't know that I actually went to see you. But after that show, I was <laughs> like, wow, they can play. I mean, it was yeah. so good. It was really exciting. And, and uh, um, it, it just, you know, you play so well. It's just, and I know you went on to play on so many people's albums and, and, mm -hmm. and do so many different things. And it's just... Uh, you know, I, I, well, you know, I, I know how to, I know how to study and I set myself onto the task of learning how to play that way. I set myself on it along with a full curricula that I had made up for myself. But <laughs> at that time, because we did our lead guitar player quit and Gene and Alice turned to me and said, well, you have to play lead. And I'm like, what? Wow. I did not want to put myself at, in the firing line. Because that's a really exposed position. You know, you're going to take a lot of shit. And um, at first I did. <laughs> but that didn't last too long because I knew how to work, you know. And so I, I um, expanded and I, uh, you know, I just got better and better. And I had really good friends, you know, lucky, low, luckily Lowell George and uh, Skunk um. Baxter, Elliot Randall. Uh, I would say, and, and, and a little bit Bonnie Raid, but except I, I turned Bonnie on to having the courage to switch also to electric guitar, and I wow. introduced her to Lowell George. That was huge, wow. you know. But um, I was lucky to have those friends, and so there was like this nucleus of players who really knew what was up, you know, and we were all for improving and getting the best amps and getting the best sound and all that, so the bar was really high. Yeah. You know, and we have... Were, mm -hmm. Sorry, we had a couple of fan questions for you asking about your technique. Do you yeah. mind if I no, run no, no. a couple things past you? Mm. Uh, there is Phil from Wings of Pegasus. His questions were so wordy, I, ha I had to filter it down. But um, he wanted to know, uh, how did you work on matching your vocal phrases with your guitar counterparts? Is that, mm -hmm. was that yeah. like for a separate process or? Uh... Well, that, that's a good question. I, you know what? All I can say is um, as a band, we jammed all the time. And I think that that's really important. That all those hours that we spent just fucking around, you know, turning up and get, maybe getting a little stone, just playing for ourselves, really. So we, we were able to hone it because we were living in our own house. We could play 24 hours a day. Anybody could drop by, well, if we wanted them to, any time of the day, of the day or night. So we did that a lot. But also, let's don't forget that we started our band, The Svelts, in 65. Wow. So, you know, uh, even starting with the early, like walking the dog, you learn how to play that, uh, you know, ostinato guitar part while singing his lead part. And so... We tore this stuff apart because we had we had to learn ourselves how to be a band. Nobody was showing us anything. So we would get together in our houses and we would play, you know, the the repetitive stuff and we would learn how to sing against it. Motown is really great for backup parts or even, uh, you know, Be My Baby and all that stuff. We learned all the hits. And so that is really, you know, that is great rock and roll training actually that really yeah. is is learning yeah. it's just listening to records and learning parts and, and, and uh, we did assiduously we really did we learned all the parts and uh, to this day i say you know uh, the first all-girl band who can do those kind of parts and play and write great songs they're going to be the ones who are going to make a massive change 
I yeah. love your version of badge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I remember I learned it off my boyfriend <laughs> and he, but he didn't want to teach it to me. And then, mm. and then I started playing. He goes, how'd you learn that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. You still friends with him? <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he passed away, but we were very, very good okay. friends. That's, part, that's yeah. Jesse and I, Jesse yeah, and I are both Mike, friends. Yeah. Mike, okay. Mike Reed. Yeah, and yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, also James from Australia. He's a twenty-year-old guitarist. Mm-hmm. Wanted to know: um, Did you get greater influence from your technique or from phrasing, and how did you go about? expanding those those things to create your style i don't know how you can separate those two i mean right <laughs> you know and they're all of, of a piece um and then after a while you do it without thinking i mean that's the main thing when we were performing the songs we did like badge or like ain't that peculiar or soul child or any of our songs it was an integration of a whole bunch of stuff that we had stopped thinking about you know, yeah, like when I me, uh, when, when I watch you play, it reminds me of Jimi Hendrix, like it's part of you, the guitar. Is well, I saw him you. a bunch of times, man. He was my superstar. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix wow. was my superstar. You know, he was the one I saw. I didn't see the Beatles really play. I mean, we wow. were friends with him later, but I could see his passion. And I didn't realize until uh, maybe around 2009 or 10 or something, how influenced I was by his rhythm playing. My rhythm playing is a lot like Jimmy's. Yes, and I was I, so happy to recognize this. Oh my God, really? Wow, there it is. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that <laughs> whole way that he attacks phrasing, you know. So you have to keep learning and borrowing from those whom you admire and who turn you on, quite frankly, yes. you know. But it's also uh, more more the attitude of how you play. I think what Jenny's saying is is you're sort of one one with your instrument, you know, yeah, and, and, I am. and that yeah. that's reflected. You know, when when I watch mm-hmm. the, the videos of the, of the band from from back in the day, it's like it's just so impressive to see how how into into it you are, and it's almost like time yeah. is suspended. Yeah, so I think I think you hit on it there. I'm one with the instrument. But, you know, I'm one with my instrument because I put in so many hours. Yeah. Thousands and thousands of hours. That's all I concentrated on for the longest time. Did you, you just know? soundproof your apartment and just... I wasn't in an apartment. I was at Fanny Hill. <laughs> you know, that was a house. It was, it had been, uh, uh, what's her name? The Lamar. Uh, Hedy. The actress. Hedy. Hedy Lamar, whom you know was a uh, huge in, in developing radar and in, in fact the idea of bluetooth came from her and the partner whom she was working right. with on, on so that house yeah we didn't quite really i didn't put much uh you know i didn't really know that much about her and i was focused on other things but now that i realized what she did that house was electric you know so yeah. everything conspired to bring that energy down into that and we just completely sucked into that house it was quite remarkable that was so standing what's that go ahead it sounds totally magical yeah yeah and 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 you could think of it in a way as being just a little bit scary (laughs) but we but we were up for it you know we were up for it or down for it whatever (laughs) and we went for it that's the thing we totally went for it we had this idea there's something we wanted to do. We weren't quite sure of how to do it. I mean, how, I mean, even in 65, how did you start a band? How did you start a band? That was insane. Nobody thought we could do it. You know, but our parents let us kept fiddling around and we started getting gigs and all that. Pretty soon we're, we had our own PA. We're driving around, setting up everything ourselves, you know? And by the way, uh, when we played at first, it was like this huge kind of negative thing. Oh, you know, they can't possibly, you know, kind of standing uh, with this whole attitude. And then they would fall in love with this. And afterwards, it was the boys who came up to talk. So it was good girls were not allowed to talk. That was an un, sort of an unspoken thing. So the girls would be looking at us with their eyes wide and smiling, you know, and they'd be nodding, but they didn't talk to us. We had to read the body language, you know? When we interviewed Kim from Girl School, the person mm-hmm. that put them on the map was Jeff Beck because he said, that can't be girls, you know? And 
<laughs> they were all girl band too. Well, he he, he should have known better because we did gigs with him. So yeah, yeah. I heard that you <laughs> he toured with Humble Pie and Slade. And we didn't tour with them. We played with them at at the uh, Fillmore East Humble Pie for oh, two wow. or three nights. Must have been. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know who they were, and I thought I said to Gene or the band or I said, well, that guy's really good. <laughs> <laughs> And David Which, Bowie was a big champion of yours. Uh, yeah. I would have loved to have seen you play with David Bowie. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. I know he, he took you to, a, or he invited you to a party and taught you mime. Well, he didn't teach me mime, but he sure showed us. You know, he gave us a demonstration. It was very sweet. Oh. The, whole, the whole thing, he was always really sweet to us. And um, he sent us a fan letter, which I had forgotten about Alice reminded me of he sent us his first album in a fan letter of course nobody saved it we, you know <laughs> we never thought we we're going to get any older <laughs> right <laughs> mm -hmm. wow um, so you talk about your discipline as a player mm -hmm. and i feel like a lot of players nowadays lack that um, do you feel mm -hmm. the same and do you, uh, what, where did you get that discipline from? I got it from the nuns in the Philippines <laughs> <laughs> and the American school. I mean, I think that the school system there was really over the top good. And they taught us number one, how to work. Also, my dad was a genius. He really was. And he'd been in the U.S. Navy. He was a lieutenant commander when he uh, left it to marry my mom, actually. And he also taught us the value of discipline and he taught me i remember once i had a math problem in high school and i just couldn't quite get it and he sat me down and he said break it down to manageable chunks that helped a lot with lead guitar playing you know because when you, you're trying to figure out how to do the line are you going to stay in that same four frets you're going to go up the neck down the neck blah 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 and i would break down like if i if i got into problems i would practice where I would shift over and over. I mean, I mean, you could say it's sort of an OCD thing. I think OCD is kind of cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> over and over and over. So that's how I work. I did not practice my mistakes. I identified my mistakes and broke them down to manageable chunks and learned how to shift. And that is so important. I think boys have kind of that natural thing where they will just, you know, they'll dig into that thing whatever it is over and over again and girls we have to be reminded of it you know and i had been reminded of it at an early age american school was a tough school you know they really uh they really uh, uh showed us how the value of discipline and then i went to the last year that we were in in the u.s uh, excuse me in manila gene and i went to a school assumption school that our rest of the women in the family had gone to and they had resisted that because my dad was white. And so we went to American school. But they, they both, all the system showed us how to work. And I noticed that with the girls here. They don't really want to work that hard. They want to have a good time and be the star. And that's what they are. Actually, that's what the industry and the ads and all, they have prepare them for that. I want to be the star. But I, want, I don't want to go through the process of like, you know, you press down on the string. It's, ouch. Right. You know, I mean, I can't tell you how many times a girl thought she wanted to play guitar and I give them a guitar lesson and they press down on the string and it's like, ow, well, it's a piece of wire on top of wood and you got to press down, you don't love Definitely. <laughs> Go ahead. Your, your casual style, um, was that sort of, it, you just look so natural and great and you had this long hair and and flat shoes was that was that derived from manila do you think or no it was derived so? from when we got here and we first got here and fell in love with electric with acoustic guitar then electric guitar but again it's all those hours of practice and then we were doing gigs every weekend so we grew into the role of being with the beat and moving our hair and having fun it wasn't contrived at all we learned how right. to do that ourselves because we were enjoying it you, Nobody you, taught us how to do us do that. Do you still have that level of self-discipline and tenacity? Oh, absolutely. 
<laughs> Absolutely, but I have to start all over again. Every single time I pick up the guitar, I think, God, I don't know anything, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I have to go back to the, you know, my little exercises to warm up and kind of get reacquainted with where everything is. And it doesn't take me as long as it used to before, you know, I can kind of get back into my thing. Um, I would say that what is motivating me at this point is actually I get like these messages from above. You got to write this song. You know, I'm writing a song. I actually am recording a song right now called Fire in the Street, which is Ooh. totally incendiary. And uh, it just dropped in on me. It, dropped, it started with a rhythm guitar part that had to be remembered. So I set that down on, in the studio. And uh, when I came back to the song like six weeks later to finish, you know, the last verse of the arrangement, um, I had to start with that rhythm guitar part, which I had forgotten. It's so simple, but it has to be exactly the right thing. So they send me, I mean, I'm serious about it. It's not like I'm writing these songs. They send them to me, but I have to be attentive and I have to be humble and I have to submit. You have and then to when they send it to you, you can't let go of it. And it kind of consumes you like an OCD thing is what I Yeah, think. yeah. Or I turn it into a comma. You know, that was what I did when I set it down in the studio for about a minute and a half of whatever it was that it just comes through. So that was a holding place. And then I went back to it and I had to learn exact, you know, I had to learn my own rhythm part. Because there's so many parts to choose from. You can just go off on another trip, but you ain't got the song. Well, yeah, and the spontaneousness of, of, of improvising, which I'm a, I'm a huge proponent of. I mean, I've always, mm -hmm. you know, for, mm -hmm. for many years, the bands I played with, it was like, you know, just improvise because it's not even so much just to jam, but that's a creative way of, of coming up mm -hmm. with things. And I wanted yeah. to ask you, yeah. if you, if you think the discipline is what allowed you to be the band of all the bands that were happening, you know, in the 60s, to be the one that, that got the record deal and made the breakthrough. I mean, is, is, it, is that part of it? Is it just that you were so determined and so good and, and, and... Yeah, we were disciplined in every way. So we worked on the music a lot, but if we had to do a photo session, we knew how to prepare for it because we'd been doing those since high school. You know, since we had no money and we would share one photographer for three bands in an afternoon, you know, that kind of thing. So we were disciplined, disciplined in, in every way, I think. And so, when we were asked or told by the record company, we complied up until the point in 73 where we started wearing those outfits. And, and it was because the record, because Warner Brothers had lost their faith in us, we weren't selling enough records. I mean, 60,000 per, you know, units per album was not enough for them. And they got nervous and they pushed us and that pushed me right off the edge. So I felt like we lost our autonomy, you know, and that was, uh, and my authenticity was certainly compromised. And that broke me. That is what broke me. It yeah. wasn't having to play certain things or needing to go in a certain direction. But when I realized that all of me was compromised, I just couldn't do it, you know? And everyone has to face that at some point, you know? How much are you going to compromise? How much are you going to lean this way or that way when you know and what your truth is? Yeah, to be yeah. I know, Elizabeth, you've been trying to get a word in. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. That's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I see it too. I've, I've, I've seen that. <laughs> no, um, you talk about, you know, people trying. I think for a long time in the history of women, whether it be rock and roll or pop music, mm -hmm. the record companies have tried to make you unauthentic into what they want mm -hmm. to sell records. Um, mm -hmm. I, th I think it takes a lot of confidence um, with you speaking and saying, you know, you just left the band because it wasn't authentic anymore. And I just think that's amazing. Where was your head span at, at that point? I instinctively knew, instinctively knew that I had to learn how to become a human being. I wasn't complete in that way. I had pieces, right? To see the elephant, I had pieces of how you're supposed to present yourself to the world. But a lot of that actually was, you know, dominated by what was socially acceptable. And so we broke through those barriers. You're not supposed to play lead guitar in the beginning, okay, or guitar at all. We just ignored all that. But it got too close. It got too close to my inner everything, you know? 
And so I, I, I knew I needed to learn how to become a, a real human being, but I didn't know how, and that was what scared me. I had zero, I mean, people were not talking about consciousness, really, you know. I mean, I was reading Alan Watts and that kind of stuff. So that was a little bit of a clue. And then when I, when I went on my sabbatical, I went to Long Island to this small vacation house, but it was the winter. And so I spent a lot of time just being with my own thoughts, walking in the beach. And, um, you know, gradually what I had started to learn in, about Buddhism became much bigger. And gradually I started to find teachers. And that is what saved my life. You know, um, I mean, the outside, you can see kind of, you can follow my trajectory. You know, the types of songs I was writing by 90, 1974, I had written... Uh, Heaven is in your mind and your own way, you know, songs, songs that are truly authentic to me, you know. And uh, th those are still super applicable. If I play those songs live, they have a real life, you know. So I know that they're alive. I know that the beings who brought them here through me were serious. <laughs> there were other artists similar like Laura Nero who also mm -hmm. didn't like the business and had mm -hmm. to also leave and I think her last mm -hmm. record was all uh just to get out of the contract she just did covers so she could get out <laughs> covers really oh I don't know yeah that. yeah know that. her last album she said okay mm -hmm. do covers then out out mm -hmm. <laughs> get out of the contract and yeah the business yeah, well, it, I think in the business, you know, you you were dealing with 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 racism. You were dealing with so many things. I, I'm a trans woman, and I'm also mm -hmm. bisexual, and mm -hmm. and I know that those times, were, you know, we didn't say those things. Those were like really the sort of things you kept to yourself, and and especially in the situation where you're you're signed on a label. And the record company, I don't know that they said that to you, but you know, you kind of intuitively knew, right, that we don't talk about sexuality or gender well it went way beyond that it was hard for me to even think about it you yeah. know i mean i knew where, where i was heading inside and um when i did find you know sort of like the link the real link a, as to who i was it was hard for me to think about it so there was a, a period of transition you know but uh, you know, they, the record company never said anything to me. I, I didn't try to hide anything, they, but it was sort of like a, a version of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Right. right. You know? Oh, yeah. As long nice. as I fulfilled what it was that I supposedly was uh, set, set out to do per, per the package. Okay. We knew we were a package. So we could conform with that. And, and we wanted to. We wanted to be. You just, but you know, for example, in uh, late May, early June of 71, within one month, we played both the Fillmore West and the Tonight Show, okay? Wow. At the Fillmore West, we were, we were pretty much accepted. The Tonight Show, as soon as we played Young and Dumb, Johnny shut down the set and didn't even talk to us. He went right to a commercial. So that, that would give you the, the two different aspects of you know, what was, what was going on. They were completely separate, Se completely separate, you know. What so was the vibe we, like in England? It was great. It was amazing from, from the minute we landed. So, you know, the Brits, they, they, <laughs> they got that strange sense of humor and they, they're such great recording studios and artists and their engineers, you know, working with, um, uh, what is his name at Apple, uh, on, on Fanny Hill, uh, Richard, the Perry. Beatles engineer. Oh, oh, Peter oh. Ash, not yeah. Peter Asher. No, no. engineer. John? Uh, nope. Jeff Emery. And Jeff Emery. Oh, Jeff Emery. Oh, and he had the highest respect for us. You know, I was at an AES show in New York, probably I don't know, 2000 in the 2000s, and he saw me across the room, and his face lit up, and he headed right yeah. for me. And he said, I, rem I remember doing that album with you and I loved it. I had so much fun on it, you know, and he was so accommodating because he knew I was really interested in the recording process. So everybody would leave and he would play the piano for about 15, 20 minutes. And then I was just sitting in the control room. They'd come in and say, okay, ask me anything. Ask me your questions. <laughs> oh, that's and, really you cool. know, that was a huge gift, huge gift. 
What was the difference between Fanny playing live and Fanny in the studio? Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to parse it. Although I know that, that people always said to us that we were a lot better in the studio, excuse me, live than we were in the studio. And we knew that as well. But we had to live within the confines. You know, I had uh, two meetings or two sessions with Richard Perry in the last, like, two or three years. You know, I went to, to him, his house oh, really? in L.A., his apartment. And I actually taped the conversations. They were our, for, to me, they were our truth and reconciliation sessions, you know. Uh -huh. I got to ask him everything. And I did ask him, I said, Richard, did you tr intentionally try to, you know, downsize our sound? Because that's what you thought people could take. You know, because I'm sure that in some way, everyone was thinking that, you know, we got to, we were so potent and so powerful that it was, I think it, they were proud of us, but they were kind of afraid of, the actual effect, because I, I meet people now, even I did a gig in Hawaii and some guy came up to me and said, you know, we saw you guys in Iowa, Iowa and we could not figure out how your drummer was doing those parts. <laughs> you know, everyone was phenomenal, you know, in the band. And, um, and he just looked at me, you know, he has Parkinson's, so he speaks a little bit haltingly, but I mean, we were really talking to each other. And, um, and he just looked at me, he just kind of, he didn't really say anything, but he just kind of nodded. So he was non-committal, but I was able to ask the question and put it out in front of him. And That's he did not deny gift. it. Yeah. Great yeah. Gift. Elizabeth, when I saw you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, what was your reaction when you first saw Fanny for the first <laughs> time? Like, how did you, you're, like, if you were doing a reaction video of watching <laughs> Fanny? <laughs> I am just blown away by the playing. I mean, there's yeah. just no question that those are musicians. Like, mm -hmm. they don't fuck around. Like, <laughs> it's, it's almost and unbelievable. You fuck with us. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, we had to develop that as well. Don't fuck with us, man. Well, my I mean, we're going to shit right over you, so shut the fuck up. I you had know, my husband we, watching, we and he does. was like, <laughs> <laughs> he's a guitar player, so he was just dissecting your equipment, and we saw a more recent <laughs> video of you, and I think you had like a 59 Les Paul, and yep. I still like, could. He's like, fuck. <laughs> and not only <laughs> do you still play it, you can play it better than like anybody it's amazing well so yeah it's, it's like I getting mean, back on a horse <laughs> but well, i just I, kept I, saying go june go june <laughs> go june when i was watching it i, mean, I, I really have to thank yeah i it's, really have to thank um, the guys who who really took me under their wing because without that it would have been a lot harder you know because the resistance to us even uh, playing and showing up guys at all was so fierce. Uh, you know, when there's a Fanny website, and um, I, I was part of the co-creation of it. It's called Fanny, the best, the greatest, blah, 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 which I didn't exactly agree with the name because there was also <laughs> Bertha, who were incredible. And I thought that we were neck and neck. Um, but the, you know, the industry and the, the audiences, I think, accepted us for a lot more back then. But... Um, Wait, what was I on? Uh, did I go on my own tangent or did you ask a question? No, I just kept saying when I watched your video, I kept saying, go June, go June. I was so like- Oh, have, having, you know, that thank you to our, our friends, the guys who really took me under the wing was super important. Because like I was, yeah, because I was really hesitant to go into lead guitar. I really did not want to put myself in that exposed position. I really didn't, you know, for a shy half Filipina girl who I don't even hear in one ear. I'm deaf in one ear, and I've always been that way. You know, how are you defying all these? I heard it inside. I felt it inside. That's where all the work happened, you know, and to have them basically say, yeah, you're doing the right thing. And here we are, we're with you. We're going to, you know, show you what we can. We're going to jam for hours and hours and, you know, kind of fall in love in our own way, you know, was really instrumental to my moving ahead. 
I kind of like the sibling sound between you and Jean on the vocals. Oh, yeah. Those uh -huh, harmonies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that was well, something that could have even been developed more had you had more time together. Well, you, know. you know, we did a lot of records together post fans. Yeah. So. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, in the er I'm 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 yeah. speaking to the early records, but I yeah. think that was like a really like uh, like moment when you and Gene sang together. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it was still recognized. You know, I think it was taken for granted. Yeah. And Nikki got a lot of the kind of steam for her, the way she kind of screamed out the songs or whatever. Right. Yeah, I just loved you and Jean. I just love that sibling uh, sound. Thank you. Thank you. But, you know, it was especially, you know, seeing the gig and, and knowing, you know, a fair amount of your music beforehand, it was like, it was two different experiences. And, and I have to question what you asked, Richard, you know, was it that you kind of toned us down because there was just mm -hmm. such raw power. I mean, I would have loved, you know, those first three albums to be recorded live. I mean, that's how good it was. I mean, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not saying it, you know, just because yeah. you're here. I'm saying it because I was blown away. I mean, you well, know. Well, one of the battles between often. me and Richard was he kept coming down to my amp and just turning it down to like two or one and a half. <laughs> no. Meanwhile, I had added it like, you know, seven or eight it would have been up at 11 if i could have accessed that you know but um that drove me crazy and that was one of the reasons why we stopped working together because my huge fights with him were just uh really insurmountable and he was such a control freak but such a good producer in his own way you know but we got really frustrated with his you know i mean literally coming to my amp and without asking me turning down the volume you, i mean you just don't do that and um guys still you know they still do that to me uh, well and, and you know think how think how a, a a male player would react to that you'd be like get your hands off my amp right you know and, you'd and be dead so i yeah. mean <laughs> i was just screaming you'd be dead exactly yeah you know um, and, but was it out of the frying pan into the fire then when you worked with Todd Rundgren? Um, at the time, I was really depressed. And he, we didn't realize it, but the first day of recording, he made clear to us that he was a producer and he knew more than everybody else. And uh, I'm the only one who remembers that. It's in my book, Man of a Thousand Bridges. Um, I am, and I've talked to Gene and Alice about it, not Nikki, but um, I remember it so clearly. And um, he was lying on the floor looking up at us with his, you know, head behind, his hands behind his neck and his legs crossing. And I, this is exactly what he said. So I'm your producer, right? And we go, yeah. And he says, so I'm a producer because I know better than you guys, basically what's going on. So you have to do everything I say, right? And, uh, you know, I guess we just nodded or whatever. And we went to sleep to that. Oh. I remembered. But everyone, you know how you do when you're a woman and some shit happens? And you just <laughs> go to sleep just to get through. Just to get through. Yeah. And we did have good times with him. But, you know, I feel like we were kind of like in a dream. I mean, I don't remember much of the sessions. I don't remember doing Long Road Home, for example. I don't remember doing I, Lo I Need You Need Me. I just don't remember. I remember one, one overdub that we did as a band with him as a producer, and you know there was no save as is, so we had gone gotten through most of the track, and we discussed, could, God, could we just punch the whole band in, you know? And we did it on the first take, and so that was a to me that's the moment I remember because it's so technical, you know, because you know you all have to play with the right in the right uh, volume you know, even yes. to punch in like that. But we didn't, and I can't even hear where it is. I, I'm not even quite sure what song it was, all mine or whatever. <laughs> but well, he did a good job, I would say. Blitz about, what were you trying to say? Oh, oh I, I just, asked Marina. I just said, wow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Marina, you were in a band with guys, and you were in a band with all girls. When you were in Viva Beat, did they try to tune you down or... Did, um, actually, was there a, a big difference? Can you relate to what June's saying? Yeah. Um, I think there were moments of it, but I was one of the key people who started Viva Beat, so it was, you know, I got it some, mm -hmm. but I was pretty tough. Mm -hmm. um, 
I was able to push back uh, in mm -hmm. my own little quiet way. Mm -hmm. I felt like it. I, I felt more in the studio than at rehearsal or at live shows. I felt mm -hmm. like I really had my weight, but I know what you mean about mm -hmm. the studio thing. It's like, okay, nice little girl, you play your little keyboard part, do your vocal, mm -hmm. go have a, you know, go have a glass of wine. And, um, <laughs> Or a line of coke, whatever it was. You know? mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah. I feel like I held my own pretty well. Mm -hmm. I think backstage pass actually being in a girl band was a tougher dynamic. We fought more in backstage pass than we mm -hmm. did. <laughs> yeah, they're tough. I tell you, I just started playing with them <laughs> the last couple of years, and yeah, I, I don't say shit because I know I'll get shot. There's yeah. a lot of fighting going on. <laughs> it's like a family. Mm -hmm. No, it's great, actually. And, and, it, and you know, for me, it, it's like an honor to be able to, to play in that situation. And, and seeing Fanny back in the day, it was like so exciting for me because it's like, oh, these people aren't adhering just to, to gender and gender ideas. And, you know, this is the way women are supposed to be. You were just kicking well, ass. Well, we always had to, to decide if we were going to swap the, the nouns and pronouns in songs since we started in the smells in 65. So I think that was the beginning of our, you know, trying to figure out how we were going to place ourselves in a song, right? Um, I, I do a live stream now every week and I, I did uh, a Run For Your Life. You know, because it's such a fun song, but you hear the lyrics, you know, I'd rather see you dead, little girl. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. But uh, with respect to Badge, see, as women or as girls, you know, growing up, we heard the lyrics to Badge differently than guys did. We, that is a song for girls to sing. You know, yes, I yeah. told you not to, you know, that was for us. We owned every single word. And we played that song over and over again, believe me just for us, for fun, you know, in the living room. That's great. So by the time we were getting out there playing for audiences, we were playing it for us, but, you know, they got to watch. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like uh, playing with your sister? Well, that was, of course, always had a euphoric edge to it because we started playing with the ukuleles to get together, sitting in our room playing with the radio, you know, so... In fact, uh, when Gene and I did the album Play Like a Girl in uh, 2009, and actually we recorded that song in 2009, the album itself was released in 2011. And so we went on the road to do some gigs and the first gig was in New York, but we rehearsed here. And my partner, Ann, turned to me and she said, you know, you only play like this with Gene. There is something that, some little fire that gets lit, you know, and I played differently. I, I miss playing with her, to tell you the truth, you know, because she's unable to play right now. So um, I just have to call that up inside myself somehow to get the frisson of, of that, that real thing that's very real between us. You know, even when we talk about the music, you know, talk about music per se. Like when I started doing uh, my live stream, I would just be pulling songs out from, it's like a life review, you know. So I did um, uh, Battle of New Orleans, New Orleans, you know that song? Yeah. Where they went to the rounds and they went to the rebels and went to the and we sang that to each other on the phone. That's all part of our common language, you know, that we can feel that when we do a song. If we're doing badge, we're actually also doing Battle of New Orleans. You know what I'm saying? It's that thing, that beat. Yeah, you know? like the Everly brothers or something. Oh yeah. I, I really like enamored with Sibling, the sibling sound and um, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a question for you, June. I know mm -hmm. time is ticking by and I want to uh, circle back for a moment to a few things that we talked about. And mm -hmm. one of it was we started this conversation with you being in Massachusetts at IMA. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you to tell our listeners a little bit about IMA and what you're doing now there. Mm -hmm. Well, IMA is a nonprofit for women and girls in music. That is its uh, mission statement, but it also goes further to say, especially single mothers and women of color. So we have always uh, had at least half of our board be women of color, you know, 
And how it started was I was at a meeting at Olivia Records in 1976. I just started to play with Chris Williamson and I was at a meeting, which I really didn't want to go to, but Chris asked me to go. She said, you know, they're trying to figure out how to get more women of color involved. And I really hate that kind of attitude. Are you going to use me to get women of color? You know, it's, I have to, whatever. But I went for Chris. <laughs> And at that meeting, so this is 1976, and she lived right across the street from the uh, offices, and they were talking about what women's music was going to do and how, for example, it was going to be completely egalitarian. No one was going to be more popular than the other, which I already knew was impossible. You know, this world is built on popularity. It's part of our human condition. You can't really, you can say that that's one of your goals, but I, I knew it wasn't going to happen. And, uh, you know, no one's going to be more popular, no one's going to have more money, so we're gonna, all the money's going to split in, they're going to share all their resources, like they're going to build a studio and everyone's going to share it. I, I mean, I just knew that wasn't going to happen. So, but the, the point is, I heard this voice in my head say, well, who's going to take care of all the women who are going to come in the future, right? Because they were, you know, positioning so, themselves as this huge umbrella that was going to make everything work. And I knew things don't work like that. That's why I had to leave Fanny. I tried to tell everybody why I was leaving. It was so hard for me to leave. It was hard for Jean. It was hard for everybody. But I had to. So I had already learned these things. So cut to 1986. So 10 years later, and I'm in San Francisco. And, and you know, I, had, I was really peripatetic for a long time. I did a lot of gigs. And I was in San Francisco, even though I was living with Anne here at Hampshire College, and I was talking to Angela Davis, and I was telling her about these voices, which were now really alive, and they were coming to me in my dreams. So I was getting directives, you know, and she said, well, get going, and I'm like, what, me? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not an organizer. I'm like a dreamer, you know, and she said the only thing that could have worked with me, and she said, um, well, they're talking to you. Oh, my God. She was right. You know, so I had to take the responsibility. And I talked to Anne about it and she had always, I didn't know this, but she'd always wanted to be involved in starting a, a educate, be involved in education, starting a school that would be different, you know. So the different thing about IMA really is that we do not work from the patriarchal model. Now, I don't say that out loud very much, but that is what we're doing. We are revolutionary. We are changing the world literally one girl at a time, you know, or one person at a time. But, you know, with the girls' camps. And we weren't able to do the girls' camp. And she was on our founding board, by the way. Um, so we are truly revolutionary. Um, so we just started to build it. I, I started to make calls to, I asked around, you know, whom should we get? And I, I called Roma Barron, who's in New York. She's Laurie Anderson's producer and a great, great engineer. She said yes right away, wow. So we started it with a, co a small coterie of, of really revolutionary minded women. And what the hardest thing was that the IRS could not understand our proposal to be listed as a nonprofit 501c3. You know, they saw, women and girls and music for all of time and, and air helping in every way we can and blah, blah, blah. And we couldn't get the 501c3. So we were under the umbrella of the San Francisco Farm, a women's Farm, a women's building for like a year or two. And finally we started to get little grants. Okay. And we ended up in Bodega till uh, 2000. And right around the time actually that David wrote that, you know, that uh, wonderful statement that he made. And right after that, we had to start looking for a place because we, you know, we were not able to buy that little space and blah, blah, blah. It was an artist colony, was a little bit under, under the radar, it wasn't up to code. So finally, just before 9-11, we closed on this place. And uh, all of a sudden, wow, it, it really was the right thing to happen because I hadn't really even thought about Rock and Roll Girls Camps before that. We were just doing adult content and we're doing lots of shows we're doing a show a week or every two weeks in bodega and the petaluma santa rosa that whole area they they came the women came to our shows but every show had a workshop component and um question and answer during the show that made it educational so you know for example maria Mildar, whom i already knew from 
having left Fanny and being in the Boston area doing gigs. We did, me and, and uh, Jeff Maldar, we did gigs together, you know. But now she comes to Bodega and I get to ask her questions and the audience gets to answer, ask her questions. And it was so deep because she talked about how she got her first record deal. She would go into New York, her parents didn't know she was going, you know. Is and, it her uh, birthday, Maria Maldar? I think it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think um, it's her yeah, birthday. I think it's just yesterday or something. Yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, how uh, you know, my life would have been a different movie if this had existed in, when I was picking up a guitar in high school. Yeah, a lot of people have said that. In fact, with tears in their eyes, when they open the door to the barn and they, they put a foot in and they can feel the energy and they just turn around to me, literally with tears spring in their eyes, saying, if only there had been a place like this when I was a teenager, you know. So it is so valuable and you can't... Uh, you know, the value of it is in the air. It's not really physical. Although we do have the barn, we have a house, 25 acres, a performance space. We built two recording studios into the barn and built a bunkhouse for our camps, you know, et cetera. Yes, that's part of it. But I would say that most of it is invisible. It's, it's the heart and the passion and uh, the sharing that we carry, the community. Um, aspect of it is so important you know so you have to visit to get it <laughs> i'm planning on coming field trip <laughs> yeah i want to go <laughs> can you tell exactly. us about your podcast um yeah. well you know for a long time i've had this feeling like i know so many people and i put a lot of people together actually without you know it being like a big deal and um so I, th I thought I should start these conversations before I go so that people actually know what happened, you know. And in fact, I asked Jeff Emmerich, he said yes, and then he died on me. <laughs> um, same thing with Paul Buckmaster, the great arranger. I asked him and he said yes, and, and then he died. And I thought, I better get the show on the road because people are dying on me. So I'm having conversations with people whom I respect and I have... Uh, you know, uh, basically a relationship, whether it's long or short. I mean, Rebecca Hartka, the, the cello player, I've only known her for two years, but, you know, certainly she lives in this area and a connection has developed. But for instance, Chris Williamson, I've known her since, what, 75. So um, it's, it, it's a way of getting down to the treasure vault, you know, and exposing that. What really happened? What were the consequences the, of the fights and the love and the joy and the incredible music that we've, what, why do you do it? You know, how did that start? So with Jeff, you know, with Skunk, how did it start? I mean, I had to ask him that, you know? And, and so I always find out a lot, a lot from these interviews. I'm uh, editing Adrian Torf right now, the pianist on Holly Near's Fire in the Rain. But then after that comes Earl Slick, who's actually here right now visiting his son, my nephew, uh, oh. Lee John Maloney. Yeah. So, um, and that interview with him was really interesting. I even had to look up, well, you know, which of David's albums did he play on? And when did he and Gene get married? And it turns out that he had just done Station to Station when they got married which I didn't never, never had put that together. You know, I all I knew I, was I had to get the ring to the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I saw him on the Diamond Dogs tour, the Diamond yeah. Dogs tour. Yes. Yeah. Did David but, ever ask you to but, be on a, be on one of those tours? No. No? It would have been great. Yeah, it would have. Mm -hmm. But see, I left, I left Fanny in 73, so, yeah. Yeah. you know. It would have, it would have been yeah. great together. Mm -hmm. What's the name of your podcast? Where can what's it called? Uh, Blood in Our Veins Dash Conversations with June Millington. Beautiful, <laughs> really, love really it. great. Open up our veins. Yeah, that's. Uh... <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Well, it also seems, in, you know, in the time of Me Too, this seems it's it, it it's it's all coming together. You know, it's a, all that kind of toxic masculinity is is it's not dissolving. It's always going to be there, but it's like it's being kind of pushed back and saying it's like this is this is everybody can now shine. You know, and I, I imagine that wasn't like that when you started out in the business. So, 
Absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it was even hard to think about it. Yeah. You certainly did not talk about it. So I, I appreciate, you know, the Me Too movement and everything that we're pushing against. Um, yeah, it is, in a way, the end of the patriarchy, which has built such strong and, and um, like you use the word toxic, yes, toxic and more or less kind of evil walls. So we've all felt them, you know, yeah. uh, in, in a, a land of a thousand ways. <laughs> <laughs> we really yeah, somebody have. coming over and turning down an amplifier <clears throat> you know projected out across all these years and all this time you realize that it's in every little part of the society and it, and it really has to be actively eradicated it's just not gonna well say, here's oh, the I thing I, I didn't have the language to say to richard why do you think you have the right to do that i just started yelling like don't do that what do you you know so we would fight and, um, you know, I remember uh, we were working, and it's funny because certain things kind of are in your memory. We were working on thinking of you and we just done the basic and I was just about to do my lead guitar parts. And he did that thing, he turned it down, we had a fight and then he took a phone call and he was gone for like, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes and I was really fuming. Turns out he was talking to Barbara Streisand whom we knew and whom we later backed up on, you know, <laughs> right. on a Richard Perry produced wow. album. So it's an interesting intersection, but um, the fact that he really thought it was his right to do that, and there are a lot of guys who still feel that way, you know, is a little bit of an affront to my own sensibilities, but still we have to gather our thoughts and our position and try to, uh, you know, give the argument in a way that doesn't just cause people to blow up, you know. Because a lot of people don't think about this stuff, right? What were some a of your of favorite still... collaborations? Uh, with whom? What, Just what, uh, with musicians, the... producers? Yeah. Or... yeah, with musicians or other well, artists. Cer yeah, certainly, uh, you know, certainly Chris Williamson really a lot because I, I played with her a lot. And I don't know if you're familiar with, with her music. Um, Ad Torf, whom I was just referencing, because she played on Fire in the Rain, which is a Holly Near album. Um, I produced Lee is one of the, Lee is one of the best musician, musician, Gene's son, I know. He plays bass, he plays drums, he writes, he plays guitar, he's an incredible recording engineer. So I would say he's really kind of at the top of my list and I have to interview him at some point. He's only 35 though, so he hasn't really, you know, <laughs> <laughs> his frontal lobes have only been used together <laughs> for 10 years but but you know um i i would love to interview him uh, at some point you know he doesn't like to use mommy and daddy as a crutch so he, he doesn't really like to talk about that much but <laughs> um so there's quite a few uh paul van wagenen and Wanging in, who's no longer with us uh, as a as a drummer, I love playing with Janelle Burdell is an incredible drummer, and uh, she's actually in Washington D.C. doing a recording project right now with Tread Fury, who is also great. So, you know, there I think there are quite a few um, Tom Sellers who co-produce who or whom I co-produce Ladies on the Stage with well, an album I did with Gene in. Uh, 76 77 taught me so much so much she taught me how to write charts really in, in, um, in just the best way you know so there's there are really quite a few people you talk about petaluma did you ever record at neil young's studio no 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 uh -uh. yeah and i never really met him yeah although you know when i because I'm turning my book into an audio book, Land of a Thousand Bridges, turning into an audio book. Oh. I, uh, it's like a life review because I have to, have to. I listen to songs with reference to what I had talked about, you know. So I re listened to Soul, uh, so is it Soul Child? Soul? Mr. Soul. Mr. Soul. Mr. Soul. Yeah. Oh is, my is God. That... And I realized such, I mean, that isn't everything I do. Mr. Soul, my God. Is that Buffalo Springfield, Jesse? Yeah. yeah, I think it was Buffalo Springfield. And of course, there's always uh, expecting to fly, which is incredible. Oh my gosh. It's like, one and of I've my... never met him. Oh, yeah. 
What a song. Yeah, it's incredible, incredible. So, you know, these are things that I remember that I have in my body that I can pull out when I just need a little something. But the main thing to, uh, I feel now in terms of my creativity is just sitting still and finding silence. And then I just start hearing it. I just start hearing it all. But that's because I've listened to so much stuff in the past that's so good that it's all in, my silence is informed by my musical memories, you know, wow. and then they can become part of my new thing, right? Like when you hear Fire, fire in the Street, it, it'll really be, it'll, it'll really rivet you. It has really something and Lee's playing drums and he's going to play bass, wow. you know, so uh, it has that thing and it has, it has that Millington thing, you know, because he's got Gene's thing. That's the closest <laughs> I can get to it. has got him. all the DNA. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Gene's genes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So That's will there be music in the audio version of the book? Yeah, yeah. Say that again, Marina. I didn't hear you. I was asking if there would be actual music in the audio book itself. That's oh yeah, it's, it's it's music I create for now. It's music. Sometimes I do pieces of you know people songs. Like I did a uh, uh, a bit of Do You Believe in Magic. And I just recorded oh, I myself a guitar and vocals and I, I sent it to, I sent it to John Sebastian and said, you know, is it okay? And he's like, oh yeah, I think it's great. You know, that's the last concert I saw before COVID started. Mm, really? Was mm. him playing for a uh, wild honey, which is an autism think tank. Mm. And mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it got sort of a, a tribute, but he played also and mm. uh, just hit such a variety in his songs. Well, yeah, and uh, when he played here, he did a benefit for us, and he admitted he had a huge crush on Maria Moldar. <laughs> yeah. in the day. So, I mean, all these pieces in my life, that's why I do the pod podcast, because all these pieces, I mean, they they intersect all over the place in me, yeah. you know? And, and there's a synchronistic aspect. Together, they're much more in my inner life than separately, right? Wow. Are you You're still a Buddhist, Jean? <laughs> June? Well, yeah, how could yeah, how could you not be? I mean, <laughs> once once you realize the truth of the eightfold path and you start to get into it, you know, um, it's nothing but medicine. I'll tell you one of the things that helped me the most. Um, I studied with Ruth Dennison for you know intensively for like three or four years. She had a place down in the desert near Palm Springs, and um, at one of her you know talks. She uh, did a discourse on the four, um, what is it, the four something. Anyway, she concentrated on one. I've never found out what the other three are, but it, the, the one that she concentrated on was joy in the joy of others. Mm -hmm. So consider that, you know, that is big medicine. And I have been concentrating on that for the last, what, I probably heard that in uh, maybe 82 Wow. <laughs> you know, and it helps so much with jealousy. Like, why is that person getting blah, 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 you know? And it helps you to equalize that. And then time passes by. In my case, especially, a lot of stuff has, has like, equalized itself to, to the point where Fanny all of a sudden has become the thing. You know, I had tried to escape Fanny for the longest. I would not listen. Uh, you know, my mom and Alice and Jean and Toshi Regan, who was a, a good friend of mine and a big influence. I said, you should listen to Fanny. And I would not listen because it just brought up so many bad memories. You know, I would have dreams and I'd hear low sounds, scary sounds coming from the basement. I could not do it, you know. And um, it was the the release of the four album, you know, set. Uh, yes. First time in a long time. That forced me to start you know, listening and realizing, well, maybe we were really that good, you know. And I said to Anne after listening to, I think it was Young and Dumb, I literally turned to her and said, you know, I always wanted to play like that. I, I just didn't know I did. <laughs> oh, my God, she laughed so hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, but interestingly enough, I mean, I, I read the comments that are on the uh, Beat Club, you know, uh, 
whatever, the page or whatever. And there are thousands of them, you know. So every once in a while I go, when I was back, I was reading some of them, Gene, over the phone last night. And it's incredible. People are like, why did I not know about you guys? You know, I just found you through whatever. Right. And they're completely freaked out and they are pissed. You know, <laughs> why did you get buried? Well, you know, I have my own reasons, but interestingly, I just kept doing my thing and breathing and, and doing music to the max. And then 50 years later, all of a sudden, it's the thing. It's the thing everyone's talking about, right? Ain't that peculiar? I'm so blown away. Well, you know, as far as I was concerned, and I said this to Alice, but she she said, well, I don't know. I said, to, to me or to us, I felt like that was just another day at the office. We played our asses off every gig you know talk about I the never... french the french television show what about it that was uh really <laughs> i think you guys sounded amazing you, you were really peaking uh, you know i i was in a lot of uh, psychic pain because they couldn't get my sound together i couldn't hear myself in the monitors so you know we were that good despite the fact that i was really pissed because i couldn't hear you know it's really awful when you're in a band and you're, like you said, peaking. I don't know if we were peaking. That was 71, right? Wasn't it 71? I'm pretty sure it was 71. So peaking would be, for me, would be like... Well, I, I don't know about peaking, but you guys were really like coming, you know, really had a lot of power in my... Yeah, opinion. but we didn't think of it that way. We were doing our thing to the max and we didn't allow ourselves to think of failing or not being a hundred percent. I mean, I never could not play at a hundred percent. And, you know, in a way that's a lot of pressure. I would practice after gigs. I had the roadies bring up my tape recorder and I would learn new licks, you know? So I took that pressure seriously. Yeah. So uh, the fact that I couldn't hear myself for the first half of the, whatever the first song was, I can't remember. I think it was Badge. Um, I was in, uh, uh, I was, you know, in a lot of pain around that really meant a lot to me that I couldn't hear, but I'm yeah. saying it to you guys and it doesn't, it can't possibly feel like what I was actually feeling inside. I know how I was feeling. So what I'm saying is, yes, it sounds great, but it was tough to do and we had to overcome it anyway. They said, we're going on now. Well, you know, okay, you're on, the red light comes on and I, I'm like, what? You haven't gotten it together yet, you know? You don't have a choice. You know, it's like different stages, different, everything's, it's like different people. They all have strings, they all have instruments. You, it's just like, it's a crapshoot. Well, yeah. it didn't feel like a crapshoot to us. We had to deliver every single time. Yeah. It was not a crapshoot, right? You know, we spent a lot of time on our, on our sound checks just to make sure that we could actually hear and feel the thing, you know, that we were doing. I mean, it was really important, <laughs> yeah. as we know now. But yeah. we knew it was important back then. Every single moment was like, you know, it was a fighting tooth and nail to grab that spot, you know, where people actually listen to us. Yeah. It was a, a different wow. time, completely different time. It was tooth and nail, man. June, was there a show looking back? That was the opposite of that. That just remains one of the great shows of your life. Maybe Which the one? Is there a show that comes to mind? Mm. Of just the show where everything went perfectly and was really one mm. of the great shows of your life. I, you know, I can't pinpoint one actually. You know, some of them would been would have been in the spells. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I would say some of the shows in England, but it's hard to, you know, here's the thing. I, I was talking to uh, Amy of the Indigo Girls once, right? And she asked me the same thing. Do you remember, uh, you know, a show that was like particularly, and I looked at her and I said, I can't because the best shows are the ones that I disappear, where I disappear. And she just looked at me and laughed and said, yeah, that's right. So I cannot really remember because I would leave my body. And um, therefore, it's just conjecture on my part. No, I saw you <laughs> floating at the top of the whiskey that one time. I'm telling you, <laughs> there was something out of body. I, mean, I, I was like, yeah. my, I was coming out of my body. And eventually, yeah. 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 there were some shows. Yeah. 
Yeah. Fade away radiation. There was a lot of good <laughs> stuff, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, it's also something I can really relate to because I'm, I'm releasing all the stuff from the bands I was in in, in the uh, 80s and the 90s. And mm-hmm. I wouldn't listen to it because I transitioned in the interim, you know, mm-hmm. within a couple of years of the band breaking up. So, mm-hmm. so to, to reconnect, I put it off for, you know, 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. And so I can totally relate to what you're saying about going to your back catalog and you're like, I, I just don't want to hear it. You know, it's for a different reason, but, but you know, there yeah. are similarities. And so, so I, I totally get that and and it's a hard thing but now you've sort of like reconnected with it it's like it's been this long cycle and everything's come back together right well let's put it together i'm 72 and a half and i don't give a shit anymore <laughs> really you cannot hurt me nobody can hurt me actually i mean how much more than can you do than try to disappear me which has right. been done over and over again you know uh not only wasn't i and fanny which was a disappeared band but also like Like I said, I'm half Filipino. I mean, I certainly noticed racism way before sexism. That was my real first pain since the Philippines, you know? And so how much more can you do to me? Not a lot. I really don't give a shit anymore. You know, you can live in your own thoughts, not you guys, but the the resistance, the resistance is futile because we are coming. And I, all of a sudden, there we are. Here we are. You know, I'm talking to you guys, and people are freaking out at, at the YouTube stuff, and I've got my podcast. Resistance is futile. You know, it's going to, what I have done is going to live longer than your resistance. Let's put it that way. Yeah. It's more right. potent. And that's a really good feeling for me to, to know that it really did, has gotten to that point where, you know what? I don't care anymore whether or not we're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I really don't care. You know, I expect that we will not be for whatever reasons, you know, the name. I mean, give me a break, you know. Steely Dan, that's a sexual toy. I mean, give me a break. Um, But I don't care. I don't care. I feel nothing for the people who disparage us, you know, or say weird kinky things on on the sites, you know, on the YouTube sites. (laughs) They play for the other team and all that. Come on. Why are you talking about that? Why are you talking about that, right? Yeah, Yeah, it's 2020. It's their own, you know, it's their own inadequacies. They're just projecting their own bullshit onto onto you and everybody else. It's just so sad. Yeah. Well, what we did is so much bigger than that. So there there I rest. That's where I rest, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You you found peace in your corner of Massachusetts and clearly Mm. looking back, and still connected to all of this. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful and inspiring. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've cer- found a certain amount of peace. But, you know, always when you're involved in the critical, uh, create, creative or creation aspect of what you're doing, there's always, you know, that tension. The Which undertow. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And Thank you for sharing questions? all of this. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really wonderful. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, great talking to you. And you have my email, so you can write to me anytime. We will. Well, anybody can write to me at June Millington at Gmail. So, you know, I'm really Millington. accessible. At Gmail. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's it. If you can remember June Millington and Gmail, <laughs> you you're going to be hearing me. from us. <laughs> you will. I think you'll be okay. hearing from a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. I love it. I love it. Is there a period between June and Millington or just one thing? Just June Millington. Just plain, spare, <laughs> bare, no, no caps. She's not going to let him take that from her. That's right. Not that, y'all. <laughs> I'm getting it tattooed in my brain. Mm. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you so much, June. It's been wonderful. You're so welcome. Okay. So we'll talk again. I yes. hope so. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs>